any individual witness to the Holocaust, I think, is obliged to act as a witness. So one can't wipe it out of history. The murder was on such a large scale, and each one has his or her own valuable story of that. You know, it's not exactly a picnic to me to talk about it, <laughs> but I never refuse. My personal story has some aspects that really show how a poisonous ideology can turn people from being decent people to being murderers. At no point, at no time, did we ever know where we were going until we suddenly arrived at a place that we never heard of, Auschwitz. You can imagine the confusion. When these gates opened, there were these SS men walking around with guns on it. One of these shaven men with striped uniform came into our wagon and he turned to my mother in Yiddish and said to us, which are your children? And she said, well, these are my two girls and these are my two little boys. So he said, let the girls go ahead. Let them go ahead, you will see them later. And I remember looking back, I think my mother had a spotted scarf, looking back and we saw our mother and we waved and she waved back. That was the last time we would see her, I know. It's been 80 years since Mindu Hornick lost Sul, her mother and brothers, in the Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camp in Nazi-occupied Poland. Between 1941 and 1945, more than a million people perished in the camp's gas chambers, the vast majority of them Jews. But there are those who have survived the Holocaust, telling their truths well into their 90s. How important are first-hand accounts, testimonies of those who actually witnessed the atrocities that were committed here in Auschwitz to understanding what really happened? The word of survivors is a very important part of the authenticity of the story of Auschwitz because, of course, we have the sites, we have historical research, but if we really want to understand the human experience of this place, how those men, women and children who were deported here uh, suffered, how the system of dehumanization works. We need to listen to the words of people who went through this place. We were still crying for our mother. Um, the people that were there said, can you see that smoke up there? Because the smell, by the way, yeah, is this terrible smell and the grey ash was falling around us. And when you sort of caught it, it was greasy. We didn't know what it was. So one of the ladies said, don't be silly, you're not going to see your mother. Can you see that smoke? That's where she is. The words from the mouth of people who went through all circles of hell has a much more profound, I would say, impact than anything I or other historians can convey in our uh, words. Of course, with the passage of time, this struggle to preserve the memory of the most horrifying genocide in Europe's and arguably world history it becomes more and more important. Adolf Hitler sowed the seeds for that genocide from the moment he rose to power in the early 1930s. Germany's defeat in World War I resulted in Berlin having to pay large reparations and give up significant territory, leaving Germans angry and humiliated. They were looking for someone to blame, and Hitler offered them a scapegoat, the Jews. Over the course of the Second World War, Nazi Germany and its collaborators systematically murdered some six million Jews to make way for what Hitler considered a superior Aryan race. Eight decades later, the generation of those who did survive the Holocaust is slowly disappearing, and with it are their memories. With every Holocaust survivor that passes away, the number of testimonies of those who made it through the horrors of Nazism grow smaller and smaller. 
First-hand accounts are fading away and the risk of history being revised or rewritten grows larger. Distortion or revision or denial has been with us. Of course, there is a risk that, uh, that the, the, the farther we are from historical events, the, the memory of these events is more fragile. There may be less people who can be the eyewitnesses that are um, incredibly important when we try to prove that something happened. Um, one example, Hungary, which was deeply complicit in the Holocaust. The trains carrying 430,000 Hungarian Jews to their deaths at Auschwitz. In the spring and summer of 1944, these Jews were collected, were put on the trains, not by the Germans. They were put on the trains by Hungarian officials, civil, military, police. So in Hungary, what happens now is a very sustained, a very energetic attempt to shift the blame entirely on the Germans. Holocaust revisionism has also come to Poland. Like so many occupied countries, under Hitler's rule, Poland was divided. Some Poles risked their lives to help save Jews, but many others helped the Nazis, some as collaborators, some as perpetrators. It's an ugly truth that was largely suppressed for the first 50 post-war years under communist rule. With the fall of communism in the 1990s, there was a brief respite, allowing historians to write history as it had happened, but it was short-lived. In 2018, the ruling Law and Justice Party, with its nationalist agenda, passed a law written to silence anyone who questions Paul's complicity in Nazi war crimes, including Jan Grabowski. They wanted to protect their own um, myth of innocence, national innocence. What the current very nationalistic authorities in Poland do is something called a distortion of the Holocaust. Distortion recognizes that, you know, there was a Jewish catastrophe. However, our people, they say, had nothing to do with it. Basically, we, they say, in Polish society, en masse, tried to rescue the Jews. And this, unfortunately, is a deep, profound fallacy. There were some people, even amongst the Polish people, who were anti-Semitic. And they were pleased that the Jews were being murdered. So we had to escape from every, every point, everywhere around us. There was danger that we were going to be handed over to the Gestapo and, and exterminated. Auschwitz today is as much about commemorating the victims of the past as it is a warning sign for future generations. <laughs> the genocides are a product of us, humans, the end result of the hateful ideologies that we, as people, create, believe and execute. Meaning history can always repeat itself. In the words of Auschwitz survivor Primo Levi, it happened. Therefore, it can happen again. Look what happened since in Srebrenica, Darfur, Bosnia. They're killing their own people because they just have a different belief. That's terrible. But with us, they built factories of death. Never before in history has there ever been built factories of death. Be very careful about what you believe in and what you trust. I would like to instill this in, in the young generation. Judge very carefully what ideology you subscribe to. There must be at the, at the basis of any ideology something that benefits humanity, not something that destroys it.